Hello, this is Salvatore Vinciguerra. Welcome to the Fountain of Youth in St. Augustine, Florida. These are artifacts from the Fountain of Youth. They have a planetarium and a discovery globe. And the discovery globe dates back to the 1950s, which shows how people got to St. Augustine from Spain. Exploration and establishment of the first permanent European settlements and the development of civilization during the first century of European progress in the New World. The movie Inside goes into detail about the archaeological digs that went on from the 1970s and even into present time. They're still doing research and doing biocarbonate data to discover even more about this important archaeological site which dates back to 50 years before Jamestown was founded. This is the site where the first mission was founded. This is the original mission church and they recreated it so that visitors can see what it would have looked like. Let's have a look inside. There's a baptismal place for holy water and a few pews and a little altar in the background where you can see they would have put candles. These are the Tumukuan Indian burial grounds and they're on the property of the Fountain of Youth. It was discovered in 1952 and they had all of the bodies laid out in the open and now they have covered the bodies so that you cannot see them. And they only have photographs of what it originally looked like. From the artifacts excavated, the cultural interactions are now being investigated between two extremely diverse cultures. They have recreated villages of the Indians that once lived in this area of St. Augustine. Pretty soon they're going to be building a theater which is going to go into more detail about the history of the Native Americans. This is what their home would have looked like inside.
Mm -hmm. but, no, so we let the this die down to coals and then put uh -huh. the, the barbacoa top on. It wow. would have been all wood, green wood, and we would probably be smoking oysters and fish and maybe some alligator or like deer or something. And we go to move pretty early when we start to get down. see behind you, there's uh, a few structures standing just like there in the field, and that's because that's where they stood 452 years ago. The archaeologists determined that's what was there, and so we built those little huts just to kind of show people what was there. Let's go ahead and pull this out now. What I'm looking for here is the color orange. It's going to be the, the right color. Let me know that that steel is nice and hot, ready to be worked. We'll just take that, lock it into our vise here, and we'll give it a big twist. Oh, yeah, so we take a picture. Hold on. They really don't really cook them. There we go. A nice twist on that. Let's go ahead, stick that back That's in our like fire. That's like how they get the wrought iron. They twist the wrought iron pieces and everything. Yeah. And railings and everything. And they twisted all kinds of stuff. I mean, that twist is just to show your skill as a blacksmith. Continue working that. We do have to twist the other half of that. That way we can keep things nice and twisted. Up. Those charcoals are about 
Are these chain links? Yeah. They're made out of a round rod. We're using a square rod. But that's okay. We're making a fun little addition to our chain. metal flying through my shop, that's a good way to burn somebody. Mm -hmm. You guys seem like nice people, so I don't know. <laughs> Here, that's a terrible way to make friends. <laughs> don't want to brand, brand the crowd. Let's go ahead and keep that on going here. Now that fire is going to be my most important tool. Without that fire, I couldn't be a blacksmith. I couldn't get that metal hot to make it soft, to mold it into the things that I need. Twist that around just a little bit more. There we go. That'll be a real pretty chain link. That'll be something that somebody looks at and goes, oh, that one's nice. Yeah. Well, you can see all those chain links were made by hand, so they're all just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. After your hundredth one or so, they start to get a lot easier. close the rest of that chain link, but we want to leave it open slightly because we do have to look at the chain a little bit tougher than the stuff we used to make those chain links. That's because it's a little bit thicker. We lost our heat in the metal there. That's a good one there. Now we can bend that right on around the other way. All ready to go. Just to make, it's not a whole long time, but it does take a whole long time to make the chain. Ten feet of that chain takes about four and a half hours to Wow. We do want to leave this open slightly so that we can actually link it there to the rest of our chain. Super, super hot. This is the site where they have done some archaeological digs and they've tried to reconstruct some of the buildings.
There are plenty of activities for kids. This particular exhibit is an interactive exhibit uh, that has to do with barrels and ropes and uh, teaches kids about even tying knots. This is an activity for kids. It is an archaeological dig site and it has them go through the process of feeling the dirt and, and sifting through different areas of soil. This is the St. Augustine's workboat. It was one of the boats that could be documented that the Spanish used along these waterways. the Spanish Tower and where the settlement would have been. I want to get rid of that shaking. <laughs> Blow on it, make sure it's nice and clear. Now that that's done, I now will lower this weapon to my left side and I will load it with the charge. Now, see I always forget which is the one I'm on. <coughs> what my gunpowder, the charge powder is in, are in these little wooden flasks. These would have been private perches. Not everyone would have them. What this color of bandoliers is the historical term for it. The slang would be the 12 apostles because there are 12 hanging off this leather bandolier. What it does is it facilitates a lot faster reloading because that's all I have to do. Normally you'd have a big powder flask with it. Something bigger than this, much more distinct, so you don't get them mixed up. And you'd have to tilt that upside down with your finger on the spout. Open it up, make sure you get the right amount, flip it back over, and then load it in there. That's time consuming. I fill these up like this and then wear this into the fighting. This might shave 10 seconds off my reload time, which is good. The faster I can reload, the better. Now, what would normally go in next, I keep forgetting I don't have my skip ball on the shot bag, but I don't have one of those. You don't want me to shoot those here. That's unsafe at a bad time. So what I'm doing is I'm loading wadi, which is just Spanish moss because it's free. It grows on trees. I don't have to rip up a linen shirt. Now, the Spaniards never called it Spanish moss. They called it French beard because it looked like the beard of an old man who was too to fight. So it was an insult to the French. The English called it Spanish moss as an insult to the Spanish. The Tamukan natives called it tree hair because that's what it looks like. The hair on a tree. That would normally hold the musket ball in place and help compress the gunpowder. But since I'm not loading that, I'll just compress the gunpowder. Now this is loaded and ready to fire. So my next step is to clamp that down and I must Prove the match. What is prove the match in Spanish, Daniel? Prueba la mecha. Prueba la mecha. <laughs> that is normally the first command, but I skip it because I explain what it is. So I must prueba la mecha, which is make sure this is hitting the middle of that pan. That's why I needed to make sure that was clear of gunpowder, because it would be a bad time for me when I'm looking down and that suddenly explodes. So I will now give three other commands in the best Spanish I can muster up not being a native speaker. After the second one, it will sound like a gunshot. If you wish to cover your ears, that would be the best time too. Preparing, apunten, fuego! When you were the person who was in charge of the expedition to the New World, you as the leader were responsible financing the entire voyage. You had to get the ships, get them in, and equip them. Now, most guys did not have enough money to do that. They all had investors. Menendez had 14 of them. Now, that a limited amount of money, so what Menendez did was he was looking for things that would be useful, but not exactly expensive. So, uh, this, like I said, these two weapons fit that criteria. Now, we know there were at least 30 crossbows aboard the ships when they landed here. And they were being brought here for a very important reason, and that is to act as a backup weapon for the gun of the time, the Matchlock Archibus. Now, that gun had a serious problem. It took 35 to 45 seconds to reload it. That's a long time if somebody is shooting back at you. I'll give you an example. 
Tuamuk warriors had long bows, they could fire five aimed shots. For every one shot you could get off with a gun. Not good odds for survival, so that's where this comes in. While you're reloading your gun, the guys with the crossbows can keep firing their bolts at the enemy, keeping them occupied while you are reloading. Not a great solution, but better than nothing. Uh, this had a rate of fire of about once every 15 seconds. It's not a particularly fast loading weapon, but in the right hands it was pretty accurate to 40 yards. Now the one that I have in my hand is a reproduction of a Renaissance crossbow known as a um, munitions crate. Now the reason I'm saying that is because there's no, de no decoration on it. It's a very simple weapon. This would be the kind of crossbow you would see a Spanish soldier carrying. Um, Stock is a hardwood, in this case oak, so it's fairly heavy, but most of the time they were walnut. Up here, this is uh, the stirrup. Uh, you'll see why in a second. This is the prod or the limb of the crossbow, and both of these items are attached to the stock by the use of what were called bow irons. Now, this is one of two ways that could be attached. The other one was using cords and uh, some fancy knot work called a bridle. Up here, we've got uh, the bowstring. This is the nut or the roller. This is what the bowstring sits in. It's locked in place by this long Z-shaped trigger called a tickler. Now when you pull up on it, it releases and it rolls forward. The, uh, <clears throat> the spring clip here was to keep your ammunition in the, uh, the, the notch on top of the table of the crossbow so the wind wouldn't blow it out or if you were running around it wouldn't fall out. Now generally this is the way it would work. You'd put your foot in the stirrup, lean over, and there you go. Now this is my uh, quiver, and inside here I have the bolts. Notice that the feathers are only on two sides. That's so it can lay flat on top of this uh, crossbow, and then the clip holds it in place. Now generally there are no sights to a crossbow. You just simply know how yours works, <coughs> aim and fire. Wow. Wow. It is fairly easy to learn how to use a crossbow. It only took maybe a few hours, and then after that, of course, uh, you had to practice. iron gun, which I know sounds like a lot of information, but what that means is that our cannon, which actually weighs about 900 pounds, is capable of firing something very similar to this. That's a solid six-pound iron ball. You can shoot that ball accurately for a distance of three-quarters of a mile. Maximum range would be one mile is roughly where the Bridge Alliance stands today. Now, for each charge, that means unlike the cannon you see all right up here, which are all real shipwreck cannon, incidentally, uh, these two English guns following down there, it's remains of a Spanish cannon. But these are all muzzle loaders in order to shoot these guns. The black powder, the ball, everything goes down the muzzle, gets rammed down, primed, and then fired. Now, in order to shoot those guns a second time, someone's got to come along with a wet sponge on a long stick. Run right down that barrel, make sure there are no more hot embers in that gun. And that took time. See, our gun is different. Our gun, the gun powder goes in the rear, in the breech. Hey folks, if you all look toward the rear of the gun, you see a cylinder standing up. It's maybe about that high, it's got two iron rings on it. It's called a servidor. In English, they just call it a powder mug, because that's what holds the gunpowder. And we have one just like that already loaded in our cannon. Now, because of the design, a crew of about five men were capable of shooting our gun at a rate three to four times per minute, which was actually considered rapid fire for his day in 1565. And there would have been 20 cannon lighted below our shoreline. 20 cannon, each one doing three to four per minute. Of course, that means 60, 60 to 80 cannonballs downrange under a minute. Okay, here we go. For España. Luego! <laughs> this is Salvatore Vinciguerra. Thank you for watching this video on the Fountain of Youth in St. Augustine, Florida. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to this channel, and have a great day. Thank you.